welcome uh, to worship today at Pimento. It's a familiar story in the Bible on two travelers, two disciples who were headed back to their hometown of Emmaus. Easter's over, a lot of news in Jerusalem about Christ being risen, but these two, like the rest of them, weren't quite sure about that. Their hopes had been dashed. In fact, one of their phrases, we had hoped. So what do you hope for? What are you hoping for your future? Today we're going to examine how Jesus interacted with those two and restored their hope. He can do that for all of us. Thank you. Hear these words from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us, and they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. And they said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. And they came near the village to which they were going, and he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And they were saying, The Lord had risen, and he had appeared to Simon. Then he said, "Then they said to him what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What do we do when our hopes are dashed? What do we do when the things we had hoped were going to happen, don't turn out. Has that ever happened to you? I guess I'd say if we've lived in this life any time, we've had our hopes dashed. Something that, um, some dream, some opportunity that we thought and hoped would happen doesn't materialize. Someone who seemed to be on the road to recovery takes a turn for the worse. There's lots of simple uh, examples like that. Something happened and the dream you had, the hope you had, did not come to reality. And we could say, well, that's life. Or as the French say, c'est la vie. Or, or, could there be something else at work? How are we to deal with those times of disappointment? How are we to deal with those times when our hopes don't materialize or seem to be put off. How does our faith in Christ help us deal with those times? I mean, after all, 
that's why we come here. We come here to be uh, challenged and, and to learn about how to apply our faith to this pretty rough life. The question is, is God up to something in this? This hopefully familiar passage, and especially as we prepare for a walk coming up, where this is the central passage of the walk to Emmaus weekend. It will be read several times. It will be referred to several times. And so uh, hopefully this passage and how Jesus comes into play here will give us some insight to heretofore unknown disciples. They're heading back the seven miles or so from Jerusalem to their hometown of Emmaus. Uh, the, the first time we even hear about these two, uh, we, we, we think they're men. Cleopas, I mean, in the, with Bible names, you really don't know, do you? Uh, there's been thought that it was a, a husband and a wife. Uh, who knows? All we know is two travelers, one's named Cleopas, the other unnamed, and they're, they're, they've been followers of Jesus. And evidently, they've been followers long enough to have captured the vision, or captured a vision of what they thought Jesus could do long enough to have known about the news on that first Easter. So they were, they were involved in this ministry of Jesus. Long enough to hear the news from the tomb on that first Easter. Now, we kind of long imagine, and people have said, well, they were just kind of walking along and just sauntering along and, you know, we just slowly trying to get their heads wrapped around all that had happened. They, they saw Jesus on the cross. Then they hear this news that He's alive again. They, they had seen Him buried. They're plodding along down this likely dusty road, a road that's leading away from shattered hopes, dreams of a new future for Israel, heading back to their homes in Emmaus. And then Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up. I've always found it fascinating that of all the places Jesus could have been that first Easter, I mean, He could have popped up over Jerusalem and said, Ta-da! <laughs> and He didn't. He didn't. He, he comes to where these two followers are. And see, I think there's great hope when we read about this encounter that, that it reveals that in all of our disappointments, Jesus is there. Jesus is present. So miraculously, Jesus is there. He comes alongside them. Now Luke says their eyes were kept from recognizing Him. Now whether that was something He did or whether, and maybe you've experienced this, you're, you're not expecting anything, not expecting to see somebody, or you know, they're in grief, and all of a sudden here's this person, and I mean, they didn't even think. Have you ever done that? You know, he's like, well, I didn't even expect you to be here, see you, and, and then there they are. In their grief and disappointment, Jesus asks them what they're talking about. And, and it says that they stop. And, and they kind of like, where have you been? What rock have you been under? Oh, wait, <laughs> he was. Don't you know what's going on in Jerusalem? Did you, have you heard the latest? Did you know what's going on? So they fill him in. They tell him all that's happened in the last three days, which <laughs> they're telling Jesus this news. I mean, yeah, they didn't know, but it's kind of funny. So they tell him about their expectation. And I think this is, this is where uh, the, the motivation for this came. Because in verse 21, the first part, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped. Now think about that. that that's where we're kind of getting this idea of hopes resurrected, hopes that have been kind of deviated from what we had hoped. So what was this expectation? 
Well, Acts chapter 1 verse 6 gives us some insight because after the resurrection, Jesus was with them for 40 days. And He was able to teach them and tell them. So in, in, in verse 6, um, then they gathered around Him and asked Him, Lord, are You at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, they had been under Roman rule, best I could find, about 60 B.C. So here we are, and there's some, you know, so 70 years they had been under Roman rule. And, and they hated this. And so they wanted to be restored the kingdom of David. That was the, those were glory days. Solomon and David, they always referred to David. That was the, the glory days of Israel. And they had hoped this long promised Messiah would be the one. That he would come in on, a, on a, a horse and drive the Romans out. That was the hope they had. So again, they're thinking the Messiah would do this. And as the followers of Jesus, kind of is it unfolded that here's the Messiah. Okay, here you go Jesus, get rid of him. We had hoped. We had hoped. Now the word here means to be actively waiting, but yet it's in the past tense. It's kind of like their hopes were now dimmed. And again, we can probably appreciate and, and, and think about that. So then they tell him the news from the tomb, which all the followers of Jesus, as Luke says, it seemed like an idle tale. And in Luke 24, 11, they come back and they, one translation says, they thought it was silly talk. Jesus was dead. It's interesting, nobody seemed to believe that. They, this news about the resurrection, remember Jesus had told them three times exactly what was going to happen. And it came to pass. Why weren't they out looking for Jesus? We would have, wouldn't we? Yes, we'd have been, hey, let's go, let's go find Jesus. Well, they weren't because John 20 verse 19 says on that first Easter, the disciples were hiding behind a locked door because they were scared. They were scared. Hope destroyed. Hope destroyed can influence us to be less than bold, less than faithful. You know, when hopes and dreams do not come true, it takes a toll on our faith, doesn't it? We start to ask why. And then Jesus has had enough. Now that sounds strong, but He called them foolish. Slow of heart. Jesus wanted to put an end to this grief over lost hopes and dreams. So He begins to point out, He begins to point out everything from the Old Testament that pointed to Him. Now that's a Bible study I would like to have been in. And, I, and I've looked, it looks like there's about 26 references in the, Old, in the Old Testament. That's all they had, of course. 26 references to Jesus and what He was to undergo in all of this. He says it had to be that way. God foretold in the Old Testament the Messiah was to die and He would be resurrected. And he is saying, this is the way God planned for it to be. You need to understand the Scriptures more clearly. You just need to have faith that what you saw on Friday was not the end. So by the time Jesus had finished this Bible study, they reached their home and Jesus seemed to keep on walking. And they said, hey, it's getting late. Come in and have supper with us. Come in and stay the night. So they sat down for the meal, and Luke says, He took the bread, He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. <coughs> instantly, instantly, they recognized Him. And you know, I think about this, and I think about communion. And I, this, is, this is the goal of communion. In the breaking of the bread and the taking of the cup, we hope that our eyes are open and we can recognize Jesus. That in this, this 
this uh, sacrament that we'll go, oh yeah, that's what he did for us. And just like that, he disappeared. You know, after his resurrection, Jesus was not bound by the same physical laws that, that we are. And the two then spoke about holy heartburn. Were not our hearts burning within us? And they immediately got up and raced back to Jerusalem. W wouldn't it be interesting to know how long did it take them to get to Emmaus the first time and how quickly they went back? They had news that had to be shared. So they immediately go back to Jerusalem. They find the others and, and they, it, they're, they're affirming now what the women had said. And in that moment, Jesus appeared to the group. He reassured them it was all okay and this was a turning point in their lives. So let's think about God's plan. The people thought Jesus would restore the earthly kingdom. That wasn't God's plan directly. God has different plans. He was bringing His kingdom on earth just as it is in heaven. Now that will change things. But His intention was not to throw the Romans out. It was to overturn the sin in our heart. That, that the kingdom is a kingdom of the heart. That the entrance into the kingdom is through Jesus, His death on the cross and His resurrection from the dead. We can only gain entrance into heaven through faith in Christ and what He has done. Repenting of our sin, following Jesus daily. When God's plan looked like it had failed, in fact it was playing out just as God had ordained it. See what we don't see in hopes that are dashed is the continuing action of God. Maybe like those two disciples in the eleven back in Jerusalem locked behind a wooden door, we fail to see what God was doing behind the scenes. Literally behind a huge rock rolled in front of the tomb. God was at work. We just couldn't see it. That's what Easter is all about. Hopes can be resurrected because God is still at work in them. He seeks to bring ultimate good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. You know, the hopes we have, maybe they were misguided. They needed to die so something better could come along. You ever think about that? Something happens that doesn't happen, and all of a sudden something different comes along. A tornado goes through the south end of Solomon. Turn people's lives upside down. And you saw people pour out into the town that night. The, the company that's doing our demolition, I uh, spoke with him yesterday, he was, he was up there about 11, 11.30 with his excavator starting to move stuff out of the way. You saw how, I mean, I think it's miraculous how quickly things have been cleaned up down there. God was at work. Think about Joseph in Genesis. His dreams were challenged, weren't they? From the time he was sold into slavery to his brothers until his father, by his brothers, until his father came to live in Egypt, about 23 years had passed. I don't like waiting 23 minutes sometimes. Because <laughs> we're not good at waiting, aren't we? Because sometimes the timing of our hopes is not right. Sometimes we have to wait for God to work it all out. And, and Joseph recognized that. Remember what he said when he finally caught up with his brothers? He said, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. So that the line of Jesus could be saved from death because of the drought. Jacob and his family moved to Egypt. And the line of Jesus keeps coming. I don't mind telling you that this disaffiliation process was 
trying of my patience and my faith because it looked like everything was going to fall in place. We were set last fall, weren't we? Then we had to go through it again. But guess what? We saved $4,000. Now, that's no small chunk of change. That's money that can be used to help build the kingdom. And we're actually in a better position to move forward right now. So what are the hopes and dreams you have that seem to have died or delayed? What, what's going on? We can trust that God is at work in them. Even when it takes years for them to seemingly be fulfilled. See, when they are resurrected, when hope is resurrected, it usually is in an exciting new way. Something we hadn't even thought of. We can clearly see God's hand at work turning them into something wonderful. God is at work to resurrect hope in our lives so that we can learn to trust Him more. Hope is resurrected when we turn our eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for sometimes delaying our hopes. It's tough to take, but, but you know what's ahead. You knew all along the, the resurrection would change everything. And, and sometimes our hopes have to be delayed or even die so that something new and better from you can come along. So help us. Help us see in this encounter with these two that what we had hoped for is actually going to happen. That you do redeem Israel. You do redeem every person when they turn to Jesus. So we thank you for that. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.